My name is Richard Godfrey. I'm a founding member of the Independent Group. We have been working these last six years with a worldwide MH370 community of experts to help solve the world's greatest aviation mystery. We extend our heartfelt sympathy to you all today on the sixth anniversary. I have also lost a close family member. My sister died in a tragic accident some years ago. I can begin to feel with you. Your plight and the mystery of MH370 captured my attention from day one. I immediately remembered a previous accident that I had also analysed, Air France 447. I was booked to fly on Air France 447 just a couple of weeks before the tragic accident in June 2009. Victor Yunello and I from the independent group joined forces with two other experts in the MH370 community, Bobby Ulich and Andrew Banks. Together, Bobby, Victor, Andrew and I have recently published a new paper entitled The Final Resting Place of MH370. We have analysed over 2,300 possible flight paths of MH370. We have gathered a large amount of data from a number of sources. We have simulated the entire flight of MH370 from takeoff to the end of flight. To our knowledge, this is the first time that a fully validated fuel model has been included in the MH370 analysis. This is also the first time that all the different types of data have been combined using standard statistical methods. Today, I would like to share with you what we have found out. Let me begin with a quote from Sherlock Holmes. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. There have been enough theories surrounding MH370. What we are presenting today is based on all the available data and represents credible new evidence. There are two pieces of available MH370 information that have not yet been fully utilised in predicting the southern route and the most likely impact latitude near the seventh arc. Neither one was included in the Bayesian analysis provided by the Australian Defence Science and Technology Group, DSTG, which was used in guiding the Australian Transport Safety Bureau, ATSB, in their search area. The first item is the inclusion of a detailed and validated fuel flow model. The second item is the combination of all the data using standard statistical methods. The first part of the flight of MH370 from takeoff to the waypoint Igari is well documented. We have the satellite tracking data from Inmarsat, we have the ACARS data from the onboard computer, we have the ADSB data from the transporter. We have radar data from a number of radar stations. MH370 took off 41 minutes after midnight local time on the 8th of March 2014. After 20 minutes, the aircraft was established in a cruise at flight level 350, a pressure altitude of 35,000 feet. Everything was proceeding fine and according to the flight plan. The engine health monitoring reports indicated no problems. After 25 minutes, we received the last ACAS message. After 39 minutes, the transponder was switched off and the ADSB data 
ceased. MH370 was approaching the FIR boundary to the Vietnam flight information region. The aircraft disappeared from secondary radar. There was no radio contact. There was no attempt at an emergency landing. MH370 continued to be tracked on primary radar. MH370 had diverted 180 degrees back towards Malaysia. MH370 climbed to a flight level 385, a geometric altitude of 40,500 feet, and then, once it was over Malaysia, increased to its maximum speed. MH370 followed the FIR boundary between Malaysia and Thailand. When passing Penang, the co-pilot's mobile phone was detected by a base station on the island. MH370 continued at a flight level 385 but slowed down after passing Penang to the normal long range cruise speed mode at around 500 knots. Now over the Malacca Strait, MH370 headed northwest toward the Andaman Islands and joined a flight group used by aircraft heading towards India and the Middle East. The last military radar detection was an hour and 40 minutes after takeoff. Less than two minutes later, MH370 changed course and started to descend to 10,000 feet and out of radar range. Mass operations attempted to call MH370 using the satellite phone, but the call went unanswered. Shortly afterwards, MH370 turned south, again following the FIR boundary between Malaysia and India. On reaching the Indonesian FIR boundary, MH370 turned west, following the boundary between the Indian and the Indonesian flight information regions. Finally, adjacent to waypoint Bedax, MH370 turned due south a, a point a few minutes later MH370 climbed back up to flight level 390. MH370 continued at flight level 390 and the long range cruise speed mode at around 485 knots. At first for the long flight south there was a tailwind Later, there was a strengthening headwind. The satellite data picks up these changes in the winds en route and can be used to confirm the correct route. Fuel available at the start of the route south is estimated at 26,716 kilos. This matches within 40 kilos the fuel required for a flight to the seventh arc. The satellite data at the end of the flight implies a fuel exhaustion just two minutes prior at 001730 UTC. The satellite data at the end of the flight allows us to determine the position of MH370, which was 34.2342 degrees south, 93.78. 75 degrees east. We have uh, simulated over 2,300 possible flights, but we have found only one route that matches all the data. We have examined every possible start time, start latitude and start longitude for the long flight path into the southern Indian Ocean. All navigation methods, compass bearings, and flight levels were analysed. Each speed control that a Boeing 777 is capable of were investigated. The ATSB kindly provided us with engineering data from a previous flight, which was very helpful in determining the exact fuel required for the flight of MH370. The satellite data at the top of the slide shows a wide range of possible endpoints on the 7th arc. The fuel data in the middle of the slide 
also shows a wide range of possible endpoints on the seventh arc. When you combine the satellite data with the fuel data, then you can see at the bottom of the slide there is a much narrower range of possible endpoints centered on 34.3 degrees south. Blaine Gibson and a number of others have found a large number of floating debris items that drifted across the southern Indian Ocean and washed up on the shores of Africa and nearby islands. Many items have been confirmed or are likely to be from MH370. David Griffin of Cicero kindly provided us with their drift data for the southern Indian Ocean as well as the data from the aerial search undertaken by AMSA in March and April 2014. When you add the results from the drift data and the aerial search data, the likelihood that MH370 ended at 34.3 degrees south on the 7th arc becomes even more certain. The combined satellite, fuel, drift and aerial search data all agree that the MH370 endpoint was close to 34.3 degrees south on the 7th arc. We published our search recommendation last month. We also shared our preliminary results with the experts at Ocean Infinity. Some of this area has already been searched by GoPhoenix using a towfish and by Ocean Infinity with Seabed Constructor and its team of eight AUVs. Ocean Infinity are continually advancing their technology, however. Some of the previously searched area has challenging terrain with steep slopes and the debris field may have been either not detected due to terrain avoidance or detected but not properly interpreted by the reviewers. For example, there is a steep slope that lies about 20 nautical miles due south of our best estimate of the point of impact that was not scanned by the towfish and appears to have only been partially scanned by the AUVs. The high priority search area A1, depicted in green, is just over 23,000 square kilometers. Ocean Infinity covered this size area in the previous search in around 20 days, weather permitting. The next medium priority search area, A2, is a similar size as A1. And finally, there is a low priority search area, A3, but this is much larger. The FEW model shows that the search area A1 is four times more likely than A2, which in turn is far more likely than A3. Over 10 million passengers board a scheduled flight somewhere in the world every day. 239 passengers and crew who boarded flight MH370 never arrived at their destination. The next of kin do not know where they are. The airline does not know where they are. The airline industry and the flying public do not know where they are. I invite the Malaysian government to consider our published findings and in the interest of the safety of the flying public in the future, to continue the search for MH370 until the cause for the accident can be finally determined and the next of kin know what happened to their loved ones.